Uh, it's an honor to be bringing this very rich panel to a close, and I'll do my best uh, to be, be succinct so that we'll have some time for questions. Uh, and to start us off, I'd like to begin with the question that Brian challenged all of us to think about, uh, and that is, what is commercial space? Uh, I think defining commercial space is a little like throwing spaghetti against a wall. It embraces a vast universe of activities, only a few of which are likely to stick, thereby defining the whole. Uh, in a sense, all spaceflight has been commercial from its very inception. NASA and its predecessor agencies always contracted with private companies to build government hardware, and private businesses have long profited from this relationship. Young entrepreneurs hoping to strike it rich in the space business in the third decade of the 21st century thus may be surprised to learn that the idea of privately supported spaceflight and especially privately supported human spaceflight is far older than in fact they are. Uh, as many of us know, long before Blue Origin, SpaceX, and Virgin Galactic, it was NASA's space transportation system, or space shuttle, that in 1972 first offered a vision of human spaceflight as a business, a formerly public infrastructure sustained by private capital, which would concentrate its benefits in the hands of entrepreneurs willing to invest in the technology. Developed beginning in 1968, and subject to continual modification during its operational life from 1981 through 2011, NASA's space shuttles from the lowly mass simulator called Pathfinder to the final orbiter, Endeavour, offered both an inspiring example of early space commercialization and a cautionary tale on the dangers of imagining access to low Earth orbit as a profitable enterprise. Hopes that the semi-reusable orbital space plane would pay for itself by carrying private and foreign government cargo and crew members for pay, and that private entities would eventually purchase and operate their own vehicles, helped spur NASA to create the STS, but never actually materialized sufficiently to support it. From the program's inception to the collapse of the shuttle's commercial role in 1986, the STS offers modern space entrepreneurs lessons on how to set goals, imagine operations, and understand risk when entering the human spaceflight business. Next slide, please. Lesson one, don't invent your market. Historians are fond of Professor Melvin Kranzberg's aphorism that, quote, invention is the mother of necessity. Some of the most engaging stories in the history of the built world are of seemingly unnecessary products that became ubiquitous merely through their existence. Though useful in explaining how the emergence of new technologies sometimes constrains choice, though, Kranzberg's uh, second law of technology is a poor plan for a profitable business venture. Most impractical products fail, and even great inventors have proven unable to create markets where none exist. Next slide, please. Hoping to parlay his mastery of telegraph technology into quick cash, Thomas Edison in 1869 patented an electronic a vote recorder. But finding no commercial interest in the device, Edison abandoned the machine and determined never to invent anything for which there wasn't already a pre-existing need. Next slide, please. This realization soon produced the stock ticker, a device to communicate the selling price of securities that largely replaced the army of quote boys who ran through the streets of New York City's financial district conveying alphanumeric information. Repeating Edison's first mistake, the space shuttle was justified by its proponents as a technology that would create its own market. In this case, by driving the cost of delivering payload to orbit so low that it would create launch traffic that did not yet exist. In the absence of such traffic, the shuttle would offer no savings over existing launch systems, making the STS's economics dependent on its ability to transform its customers, not fulfill their needs. While there is money to be made in spaceflight today, it largely comes from offering competitive services to launch the satellites and personnel already launched by other entities, competing for a larger slice of existing space business rather than baking a whole new pie. Next slide, please. Lesson number two, government is your friend. There are few more pernicious lies spread in the high-tech world than that the transformative innovations of the 20th century arose purely through the genius of individuals and the resources of private capital, capital untrammeled by Uncle Sam's interference. Like the war fought at mid-century to defend Western civilization itself, most of these inventions were produced under the stewardship of the federal government with money provided by American taxpayers. 
As expensive items required principally for defense applications, transistors and integrated circuits, for example, had no civilian market until massive government purchases drove down costs enough to contemplate their employment in radios and calculators. Next slide, please. Rocketry and space travel, to an even greater degree, have been industries incubated by government. Able to absorb costs and take risks private industry cannot, governments subsidize R&D, infrastructure, and the development of a skilled workforce, and provide the only customer with pockets deep enough to support massive space infrastructures over decades. The shuttle's approval in 1972 owed principally to the expectation that the Air Force would share in its use. And while it would provide no funds for development, the Air Force's assent was critical in supporting such an expensive public program. Even private spaceflight is utterly dependent on the public sector for its very existence, and its ability to thrive depends largely on its willingness to accept government's large but necessary role in space exploration. Private spaceflight is, and will be for the foreseeable future, a contest, not to field the most fashionable spacesuits or launch the slickest PR stunts, but to see who can meet the federal government's needs most reliably and at lowest cost. And that means recognizing that a nation of small government is also a nation of small technologies. Next slide, please. Lesson three, first movers fail. While popular histories of technology frequently celebrate the creators of successful devices, it is rare for the first person to conceive of, build, or even sell an invention to profit significantly from it. Most gadgets we use were invented by several people simultaneously. Only a few had the capacity to build working prototypes. And of those, even fewer had the capital uh, to turn them into marketable products. The reasons for this are manifold. Not only are research, development, and production expensive steps in the making of things, but users co-construct many inventions. And it may be impossible to know what the consumer needs or wants until many competing products hit the shelves. Next slide, please. As a result, throughout his, the history of modern technology, second movers have generally fared better than first movers. I was particularly pleased to see Roger Launius' deployment of the history of rail in the United States uh, earlier today, which I think is a very good example of this. America's railroad network was largely built in the 1850s with British capital invested at a loss. The boom economy of its day, early rail overdevelopment swallowed up vast fortunes until a second wave of American investors purchased derelict lines for pennies on the dollar, consolidated networks, and figured out how to make money off the system through cheap freight traffic and monopolistic business practices often supported by the federal government. The, con the continuing lesson of the second mover advantage for today's space entrepreneurs warns that profit for these entities may not lie in new vehicles, but in process improvements and rationalizations of existing infrastructures bought cheap from their original owners. Next slide, please. Lesson four, form follows function. The history of human spaceflight has often been told as a history of a small number of outsized personalities with a unique understanding of its challenges and original solutions to its problems. Academic historians have long been wary of great man histories like these, but those seeking to profit in the space business have additional reasons to be suspicious. Next slide, please. While it is true that some of these paradigmatic ideas, like those of Werner von Braun, galvanized interest in spacecraft development, history has proven time and time again the dangers of obsession. It is not possible to produce a viable space vehicle through force of will alone and a rigid adherence to any particular mode of flight or vehicle configuration is usually an invitation to trouble. Popular interest in a radical new spacecraft design may attract initial funding, but will not support an otherwise inefficient infrastructure, especially when other cheaper alternatives become available. Next slide, please. The story of the space shuttle is largely the story of the dream of winged flight into space which its advocates supported not merely because they hoped it would be cheaper or safer than ballistic launch vehicles, but as several scholars have noted, because they believe that the space plane was, despite ample evidence to the contrary, part of an inexorable future. As Clarence Geiger wrote in his history of the Air Force's canceled X-20 program, America's first flirtation with the space plane, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, uh, uh, balked at uh, because, quote, the Air Force had been placing too much emphasis on controlled reentry when it did not have any real objectives for orbital flight. Rather, the sequence should be the missions which could be performed in orbit, the methods to accomplish them, and only then the most feasible approach to reentry. 
While entrepreneurs are often praised for disruptive and visionary thinking, unbridled enthusiasm for any one space launch paradigm is a warning sign for unsuccessful space operations to come, whether in the public or private spheres. Even in cash-rich military space programs, form must follow function, even if it produces ungainly vehicles without crowd-pleasing features or aesthetic appeal. Next slide, please. Lesson five, don't invent, augment. It is tempting to read the above guidance uh, as an indictment of innovation as a concept, but it is not. Rather, the improvement of existing technologies has likely produced as much benefit as the creation of entirely new ones. It may be difficult to attract public interest or venture capital with old technology, and so innovation in the United States often has been biased toward novel answers that excite the imagination, but which may not be the most cost-effective solution to the problem at hand. Aerospace firms bidding for contracts in the space shuttle program offered a bewildering array of single and multi-stage rockets, capsules, and gliding craft, but some were low-risk modifications of existing vehicles rather than entirely new spacecraft. Next slide, please. MSFC and Boeing were so confident in the adaptability of existing Saturn hardware that they explored the possibility of recovering and reusing expendable Saturn rocket stages without modification. Even when dunked in seawater, the smaller Saturn 1B uh, rocket's first stage H1 engines fired in static tests. As early as 1964, NASA studies indicated that with the addition of parachutes and some navigation equipment, the entire first stage of a Saturn 1B launch vehicle might be recovered, refueled, and reused. And there was little reason to believe that the larger Saturn V S1C stage could be reused as well. Studies indicated that retrofitting an S1C with parachutes and other recovery systems had a minimal effect on the launch vehicle's payload capacity and would likely save the agency hundreds of millions of dollars in fabrication costs. But such plans received relatively little attention despite the tremendous advantages they offered. Next slide, please. Under pressure to reduce costs, NASA did not choose either a fully reusable shuttle or a cheap legacy design, but an entirely novel semi-reusable reusable vehicle, supported by the hope that profits from the private launch business it sustained would eventually pay for upgrades necessary to make it safer and more fully reusable. For an endeavor, human spaceflight, that had been created and had survived on taxpayer funds and government management, it was a staggeringly optimistic demonstration of faith in the powers of the marketplace. This is not to say that NASA didn't make money from the space shuttle program. It even managed to sell an orbiter, MSFC's Pathfinder test article, to a private entity for museum use in 1983, later seeing it return to Hansfeld after a journey around the world. When Challenger was destroyed in 1986, though, the, expect the expected stream of revenue from private and foreign launch contracts for the space shuttle disappeared virtually overnight. Next slide, please. Two decades uh, after Arthur C. Clarke imagined uh, actually quite a bit more than that after Arthur C. Clarke imagined a uh, Hilton hotel uh, in Earth orbit would receive regular business traffic. The era of uh, truly private spaceflight remains a dream, undermined by spaceflight's uh, danger and expense. Uh, next slide, please. Recently, a small number of private corporations, some funded by wealthy space enthusiasts, have jumped into the human spaceflight business in many cases repurposing existing NASA technology to create launch vehicles and space capsules offering lower manufacturing and operating costs. Though members of the public are apt to view their arrival as proof of the imminent privatization of spaceflight, the new manufacturers have sought principally to compete for the same government contracts to launch military and civilian satellites previously monopolized by large defense conglomerates. In this focused and highly defined market, there is money to be made. Ensuring the safe design and profitable flight of commercial space vehicles, though, requires not only vast resources and a staggering commitment to early on profitability, but a willingness to accept the idea that innovation and invention are not synonymous. Without the goal of profit in mind, government can, ironically, afford to dream big. Success in the space business, though, is built instead, as in many other businesses, upon a merciless commitment to reducing costs, even at the expense of novelty and excellence. Thank you, and next slide, please. That is all.